No. So let's look at God's word this morning. We're going to begin in Genesis chapter 2, and then we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. Foundations to Marriage is the title of the message. Uh, just a little disclaimer here, this is not a continuation of the sermon series on Ephesians. <laughs> I meant what I said, we really did conclude uh, the sermon series last week. And I know that uh, Pastor Mike talked about Ephesians 5, Husbands and Wives, uh, when he went through the sermon series, and I appreciate that because that's such an important aspect of talking about the subject of marriage, um, and not only is it important, but that's uh, sometimes a very controversial um, topic to talk about the roles that husbands and wives have um, uh, as uh, Christians in a marriage that God calls us to. So I appreciate very much that Pastor Mike uh, dealt with that. But it's hard to talk about marriage without going to Ephesians chapter 5. And so we're going to read the verses that Paul has to say from that chapter as well. Genesis chapter 2, begin at verse 21. We'll read through 24. You can follow along on uh, the screen this morning. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then from Ephesians chapter 5, the words of the Apostle Paul, Beginning in verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. May the Lord add his blessing to uh, the word today. Let's begin at this point. I believe that there is no relationship between human beings that is greater or more important than the marriage relationship. And we see that in the biblical account that we read just a moment ago from Genesis. God officiates the very first wedding ceremony. He institutes the relationship in the solemn language of covenant. And when the man sees the woman, he breaks into poetry and exclaims, at last. And so everything in the account proclaims how profound and how wonderful this relationship is intended to be. But I think we also know that the most profound can also be the most painful at times. And I think we're all aware of the decline of marriage in our culture over the past several decades, the divorce rate is nearly twice what it was in 1960. My parents were part of those statistics when they divorced in 1965. And it was shocking at the time. Certainly, it shocked our family, but it uh, shocked our church community as well. And people simply did not know how to respond to people getting divorced in that day. Now, of course, it's become much more commonplace uh, 
in our time, uh, but not without some real consequences. And one of the consequences that has happened is just in the way that we think about marriage in our day. Along with the rise of the divorce rate, there has come an increasing pessimism about marriage in our culture. We want this wonderful, unique relationship that marriage brings but we're terribly afraid of it, and so we're caught in the middle. If you want to be married, well, you don't want to be single and alone, but you don't want to be married and unhappy. So what do we do? We experiment to avoid the pain and disappointment of a failed marriage. In other words, in our culture, what we do is we cohabitate with a sexual partner, and this practice has grown dramatically in the last 30 years. Uh, but it's only proven to cause more brokenness in people's lives. Today, more than half of all people live together before getting married. In 1960, no one did that. And One of the major assumptions that is driving the practice is the belief that most marriages are unhappy and will eventually end in separation or divorce. Now, what is so ironic is that this pessimism about marriage has led to an unrealistic idealism about marriage. Uh, People are in search of the perfect partner today, someone physically attractive, completely compatible, someone who will meet all of our needs, emotional, sexual, spiritual. Uh, We want a partner who's fun, who's attractive, who's intellectually stimulating. We want someone supportive of our goals and our dreams. And most of all, we want someone who does not demand a lot of change from us. We want the ideal partner today. Uh, Marriage used to be viewed as a sacrament of God's love, to serve our spouse, to serve family, to serve the broader community. But today, marriage is a private arrangement for the satisfaction of the individual. Several years ago, the New York Times released an article entitled, The Happy Marriage is the me marriage. My, how things have changed. Marriage used to be about us, but in many ways it is about the individual today. Never before in history has there been a society of people who are so idealistic uh, when it comes to what they're looking for in a spouse. So what's the answer? How are we to think about marriage today? Can it be successful And I think the Apostle Paul would tell us from these verses here in in Ephesians chapter 5, absolutely yes. Uh, It it can be successful. It's just that we have to be willing to look at marriage and approach marriage and do it in the way that God has called us to. Now, these verses here in Ephesians 5, they truly make up one of the great passages on marriage that you'll find all throughout Scripture, but really anywhere. Obviously, there's a lot here. We don't have time this morning to talk about all the wonderful things that Paul addresses, but this is kind of a a broad brush view. And so for our purpose this morning, I want to just kind of pull out several things that I think are really important for us to understand. And so four things that Paul tells us about the marriage relationship. It's a covenant. It's transformative. It's a friendship of enduring love, and it is a mystery. And everyone said... Amen. So let's begin with this idea of covenant this morning. We are told here that marriage is a covenant. What does that mean? Well, notice the language that Paul uses. He borrows the same language from the Old Testament on marriage. Genesis 2.24, we read it earlier for this reason. A man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, if you're familiar with the old King James Uh, version, it uses the terms leave and cleave. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And I think that term cleave in particular brings out the force of the Hebrew uh, because it means to cling, to hold fast together, to be joined together, to be glued together, uh, to be welded together. So it's the language of covenant. In other words, it's a relationship not intended to be broken. And so right from the beginning, we see that this is a most unique relationship. So what is covenant? Well, think of it this way. Covenant is not a consumer relationship, one in which you invest with uh, 
uh, as long as your needs are being met, but then as soon as that changes, then you exit the relationship because it's no longer fulfilling your desires. It's no longer pleasing uh, what you think is important in your life. But the covenant is the idea that the essence of marriage, well, it's a sacrificial commitment to the good of the other. Uh, Tim Keller defines covenant this way. A covenant is a deep, exclusive, permanent, legal, and personal binding commitment that two people make to each other. Now, that means that love is more fundamentally about an action than it is just an emotion. Now, when I say that, I don't mean by any means that marriage is merely a social arrangement void of any deep heartfelt affection and feeling. No, what I mean is that in covenant, God brings together both feeling and duty, passion and promise. Marriage is a covenant relationship because it's, well, it it has both horizontal and vertical aspects to it. Just a a couple scriptures to put out there for you to consider. In Malachi 2.14, the prophet Malachi speaks to the husbands, and he says to them that your wife is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. In other words, she is your partner for life. Uh, Expressing the horizontal aspect of the marriage, Proverbs 2.17, Solomon describes a wayward wife as one who's left the partner of her Youth ignored the covenant made before God, expressing the aspect of the vertical part of the relationship. And of course, the Bible has so much to say about those two aspects, but how important they are. Marriage is a covenant relationship that blends together uh, both aspects of love and law. And that's the wonder and the beauty of the marriage relationship. It's deep, intense love expressed in Commitment and loyalty and faithfulness and responsibility and, yes, even obligation. Now, those things do not detract from each other. They complement each other. They actually fuel one another. But I think perhaps one of the most important aspects of covenant in marriage is that it's, well, it's a promise of future love. Now, as a pastor, I've had the privilege of officiating a lot of uh, wedding ceremonies. Uh, I Couldn't tell you how many, but I'm sure up above 25. And one of the things that I've noticed over the past few years is today when couples get married, they they like to write their own vows. And uh, I, I think that's a good thing. I mean, I think that the pledge and the promise that we make to each other should be genuine. It should be from our hearts. But I've noticed that in many of the vows that couples like to write today that, well, they leave God out of the equation. Uh, They speak of marriage not as a covenant relationship. In fact, sometimes their vows sound more like a junior high social contract than the pledge of one's whole life to the other person. My love for you is as bright as the sun. I love you because you make me feel so great. Now, it really is good to be able to share things like that with the person that we're in love with. But that's not necessarily how covenant works. Wedding vows are not meant to be a declaration of present love. That's to be expected. Two people shouldn't be standing before witnesses, and they shouldn't be standing before the preacher uh, getting married if they're just there, not sure of whether or not they love each other. And so... Should they be madly in love that day? Absolutely, yes. But that's not the full intent of the wedding vows. The vows are intended to be our pledge and our promise of future love. And so it's not just a declaration that we're madly in love today, but it's the promise to be loving, to be tender, to be faithful, to be cherishing, to be forgiving, to be serving one another through all of our life, through the ups and the downs Uh, regardless of one's emotions, regardless of circumstances, over time through thick and thin. And so that's the definition of covenant. It's not meant to be broken. It's vertical and horizontal. It's a blend of love and law. It's a promise of future love. Now, this is completely uh, opposite and counterintuitive to our current culture. Our culture places covenant 
a premium on romance and physical attraction. Do you realize that this is the first time in history where we expect marriage to be a blissful, romantic relationship? Marriage used to be an economic institution in which you were given a partner for life, for children, for companionship, for succession. Now, I'm not saying that's all marriage should be, but we place incredible expectations on the marriage relationship today. We expect our partner to give us all of these things. And in addition, we want them to be our best friend, our trusted confidant, our passionate lover. And we live twice as long. How does that work? Well, only with God's help and only with his grace. But our culture says today that spontaneity of passion, sexual chemistry, the excitement, the thrill of the relationship, that's what's important. And so the thinking is, is that marriage is counterproductive to that because marriage is based on things like commitment and loyalty and faithfulness and responsibility. But covenant says the commitment of love and loyalty in the marriage is actually what makes it strong. W.H. Auden, the great poet, said, any marriage, happy or unhappy, is infinitely more interesting than any romance, however passionate. Why? Because marriage is not the involuntary result of fleeting emotion, but the creation of time and will. And so here's the point. As great as spontaneity and physical attraction and sexual chemistry are, and they are great because God created us that way. As great as they are, just remember those are only the beginning of a much deeper, more powerful love that grows through a commitment to covenant relationship. How does it develop? Well, it takes deep heart commitment, it develops over time, and you've got to be willing to make a lot of sacrifice to each other, but all in God's grace. Not only is marriage a covenant relationship, it's transformative. And so when we talk about transformation, we are talking about change. And Ephesians chapter 5 actually has quite a bit to say about change. Verse 26, that he, Christ, might sanctify and cleanse her. He goes on to talk about purifying the church so that the church is without spot or blemish, the washing of the water with the word. And so the whole idea is that Christ is involved in our lives individually, but collectively as a church to purify us, to change us, you could say. And I know the the scripture is referring to uh, Christ's relationship to the church, but the broader principle is this, God uses the marriage relationship to bring change into our life. And that's perhaps one of the most profound and surprising things about marriage, God uses it specifically for spiritual change, emotional change, heart change. Now, think about it this way. What is the purpose for Jesus Christ coming into our hearts? And I I know there's a lot of right answers for that. Uh, But the Sunday school answer is, is this, and I think we'd all agree that Christ comes into our life to help us change and transform Into his image, Romans 8, 29, we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And so in the midst of all those theological terms, don't miss what the writer is saying. God wants us to change for the better. He wants us to change into the likeness of Jesus Christ. I I like what Rick Warren says. God is far more concerned with our spiritual transformation than he is with our happiness. Now, It doesn't mean that God isn't for you and me being happy. But what it does mean is that God knows that it's spiritual transformation that will secure for us eternal happiness so that we can actually enjoy it. And that's the purpose of life, to bring change into our lives. Now, think of the implication of this. If Jesus comes into our hearts to change us, what does that mean about us? It means that we're not all right. It means more than we're just a little bit short of not being perfect. It means that we are damaged and flawed at a fundamental level, and it's usually worse than we think. We're more self-centered than we dare admit. 
Often we're more broken than we realize, and well, we can even be more rebellious than we thought was possible. And so how does God change us? Well, again, the short answer is through a combination of gospel power and gospel community. I mean, isn't that kind of a good way to sum up what the New Testament has to say about God's purpose working in our life is that Jesus, the Word of God, and the person of the Holy Spirit come to us in power to actually help bring about that wonderful change that God desires us to be. But it doesn't stop there. God has, in His wisdom and in His grace, provided for us the context of the body of Christ. And so He gives us to community, a wonderful community, so that that change and transformation can really take root in our lives in some very practical and powerful ways. Well, guess what marriage is? Marriage is an intense gospel community of two. And so what Paul is actually telling us here is that God has designed the relationship of marriage to help us change into the person that he wants us to be. He literally joins two people together to accomplish that goal. Our spouse becomes a change agent for our spiritual transformation. Now, it doesn't mean that our partner is in charge of the change, even if they tell you they are, they're not. Our our spouse is not in charge of the spiritual change, but they are an agent that God has placed in our life, graciously, wonderfully, powerfully, often unknown, to bring about the change that God intends for us. Now, again, consider how this runs against the grain of our culture today. How often do you hear people say, I didn't get married so somebody could change me. I want you to accept me just the way I am. And so the idea about marriage today is, well, it's not supposed to change me. It's supposed to complement me. It's supposed to supplement my life. And to be sure, there are some wonderful things in the marriage relationship that do complement us, and they do supplement us, right? It's wonderful to have a partner for life. It's wonderful to have kids and a family. It's wonderful to have that support and strength that comes from two people walking through life together. And so there are many blessings that come to us through the marriage relationship. God intended it that way. But sometimes in the midst of all those things that we look for, especially in our society today, for marriage to bring into our life, we miss one of the most powerful components that God has actually purposed in the relationship, and that is to bring the needed change into our lives. The problem is is that what happens in the marriage relationship, sometimes, you know, that damage and brokenness that is happening underneath the surface that we are so often afraid to look at begins to come to the surface in the marriage relationship. And so the tendency uh, is for spouses to look at each other and begin to actually accuse and blame each other for the problems that they're having even in their own individual hearts. I didn't have this problem until I met you. Life wasn't like this until we got married. And what they're really saying in that is, you're the problem. You're the cause of all this. And what God wants us to understand is, these things happen so that gospel power can come into our lives in such a way that God can change us and transform us into the people that he's called us to be at a core level so that we can rejoice and actually experience the joy that God intended for us. But in the process of actually doing that, here's what happens. Not only are we changed and we are transformed, but we actually learn how to love better. We actually learn how to love our spouse in the right way, and uh, the relationship becomes more powerful and more wonderful. And so marriage is about transformation. Don't resist the change. Don't resist the work that God is trying to do in your own heart uh, through the seeming conflict that might be there in the relationship. Thirdly, marriage is a friendship of enduring love. Uh, Verse 28 again of Ephesians 5. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but 
nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. At the heart of the marriage covenant is a deep friendship. If you go back to Genesis 1, and you remember what God was doing in creating the world. Remember at the end of that first chapter, God steps back and he looks at his creation and he, well, he sums it all up by saying, this is very good. In fact, seven times in that first chapter, God makes that uh, estimation about all that he has done. But then you get to chapter two of Genesis, verse 18, and after God had created the first man, he said, it's not good that man should be alone. Now, what changed? Well, the reason things weren't good when God created Adam was simply this. Adam was alone. And it's in this context of Adam realizing how alone he is in the world that God presents Eve to Adam, bringing her forth from, uh, from Adam in it as taking one of his own ribs. And when God presents Eve to Adam, he responds in poetry, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Some have proposed that Adam, you know, is saying something like meeting you fulfills a void in me. Or the Hollywood version would be you complete me. And so marriage is about companionship at a core level at a surface level, but at a core level, it is about friendship. But here's the reality of our culture. Many people don't know how to build a lasting marriage. Someone said, it's never been easier to fall in love, and it's never been harder to stay in love. And I think that sums up our culture well. And there are a lot of reasons why it's difficult. One of them is poor role models. A lot of people today simply have not been around good, healthy, strong marriages. And so uh, they they don't have the means, the bandwidth to even enter into marriage to know what it ought to look like, much less how to do it. How important the church is. Uh, How important you and I are. How important our relationships are. So that we can model to the world what God intends for the marriage relationship to be. So our culture can actually learn what it's like to have a good marriage. Another reason is the influence of our culture. It's a very me-oriented, individualistic culture. We take the golden rule and we twist it, do unto others as they deserve, do unto others as they do to you. If you take that attitude into the marriage relationship, well, it's going to destroy it. Another reason is you know, couples get married and they, they come to the relationship with some pretty significant emotional needs. And you bring two people together that have some major emotional needs, and if they don't know that the foundation of meeting those emotional needs is actually a relationship with Jesus Christ, not marriage, then those emotional needs become baggage. And we all know what happens when baggage enters into a relationship, couples put undue expectations on the relationship expecting that the marriage is going to meet those deep emotional needs and they end up in brokenness, disillusionment, or even worse. I think one of the major reasons why marriages struggle today is couples don't actually know how to build strong friendships. Uh, John Gottman, in his book, Seven Principles, talks about the importance of friendship and marriage. He says it's actually a key, the key, to a successful, happy marriage. Now, let me talk just a little bit about John Gottman. He is known as the marriage guru or the marriage expert. He's the founder of the Gottman Institute, and he's done extensive research on marriage over the last 30 years. He's based in Seattle. He invites couples to come of every age, newlyweds, to empty nesters to be candidates for his study. And he puts them in what he calls the love lab. And with their permission, he monitors their interaction over a weekend. Uh, He will put monitors and sensors on them so that he can measure their blood pressure and their heart rate. He has video cameras in the room so he can observe their interaction and and, and he'd even see their uh, facial expression and, and listen to uh, the tone of their voice as they're interacting uh, with each other. And of course, it's all done uh, with their permission. Uh, 
And over the 30 years of research, he has come up with these principles that are so powerful in terms of what actually makes a, a couple have a successful marriage. And he said, really, you could sum it all up in the one word, it, friendship. And when he talks about friendship, he's really talking about three important things. First of all, he's talking about couples that have a strong, successful marriage. Well, first of all, they have a mutual respect for one another, and they enjoy each other's company. Now, think about that for a moment. He's talking about fondness. He's talking about admiration. He's talking about respect. He's talking about all the things that the Apostle Paul has mentioned in Ephesians chapter 5. They have an abiding regard for one another, and they express it in fondness toward each other, not just in the big ways, but in all the small ways, day in and day out. I think it's so interesting that Paul uses the language of nourishing and cherishing when he talks about the emotional connection that ought to be in the marriage relationship. Think of those two words, nourish. It's a very powerful word. It actually means to constantly care for. The word cherish means deep fondness and admiration. Now, what is interesting about the way Paul presents it in Ephesians chapter 5 is he uses it in the context of the husband's self-love for his own body. No one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and he cherishes it. Why didn't Paul use the argument that we would expect him to? Why didn't Paul argue from the basis but, well, you know how selfish you are as men, as husbands? You need to be unselfish so that you can love your wife in a better way. But he didn't take that approach. Well, what he actually did is he appealed to the reality that there's a, whole, there's a whole lot of self-love and self-focus going on in our own lives when it comes to us, when it comes to our lives, when it comes to our physical bodies. And Paul's argument is this, take that same love and love your wife just as much, just as intensely, just as carefully, just as powerfully. The other thing he talks about is couples tend to know each other intimately. In other words, they're well-versed in each other's likes and dislikes and preferences, and they care about those things, not just the big things, but the small things. And if you've been married for more than 10 or 15 years, how many of you know that you actually have to recreate your marriage? Not go get a new one, but you actually got to recreate the relationship that you have with your spouse. Why? Because we change. That's why. And part of that change comes as we learn and relearn who our spouse is, as we care enough to actually know them in an intimate way. And that releases the opportunity for us to show them the love, the fondness, the respect that they actually desire and need. And then thirdly, they know how to repair the relationship when there are arguments and disagreements. Gottman says, I want you to know that these happy, successful couples who have a good friendship, uh, arguments and disagreements are not absent from their relationship. In fact, they argue just as much as the couples that are struggling, but they do something very different. First of all, they, they ban from the relationship any criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Not only does the Bible tell us that those things will destroy a relationship, but yeah, John Gottman in his 30 years of research has found that if you do those things over time, you're going to destroy the relationship. He says couples who do that end up in what he calls the Roach Motel. And he says what's so difficult about that is you check in and it's so hard to check out. But couples who learn that those things can actually destroy a relationship, he said they've learned how to repair it. And the repair attempts that go on, they may happen on a daily basis. They can be as subtle as just interjecting humor in a conversation when it gets too tense. It can be as intentional as asking for forgiveness when there's been an offense or a hurt. But the point is, is that at the heart of it is couples have taken the time to build friendship in their relationship just in the past couple years, and we'll talk more about this in the class. I know there's benefits that come from this friendship, 
Friendship fuels the flames for romance. It causes couples to feel emotionally encouraged about the relationship. It builds deep emotional connection called attunement. We'll, we'll go into those things more in depth. But just in the past couple of years, I've been able to reconnect with one of my brothers in a much closer way. For years, his job took him and his family out of town. And so for 25, 30 years after he got married, he was gone. We didn't see him very much. In the past couple of years, he's moved much closer to St. Louis. He's able to come in town quite often. And so it's been wonderful to reconnect with him. The sad part of the story is just in the past couple of years, he and his wife have been divorced. And when I sit and talk with him, the pain in, uh, of that broken relationship is, is so obvious. In some of our recent conversations together, my brother has admitted to me that for years, he neglected his relationship with his wife. Now, on paper, he looked like a really good husband. He was faithful to provide. He always had a good job. They, they always lived in a really nice home. They were never in need financially. He was a great dad to his kids. He still is. He made sure that they all got a great education. But he poured himself into his job, and he never took the time to build a strong friendship with his wife. And over the years, they just grew further and further apart until she walked in one day and said, I'm done. Uh, there's no more love left in the relationship. And my brother, in one of his just broken moments, said to me, I wish I had taken the time to love my wife better, to connect with her, to be her best friend, to show her how valuable and important she is to me. In Paul's words, to nourish, to cherish. That's what the relationship requires. The good news is his broken marriage has it's turned his heart back toward Christ. He is passionately pursuing his walk with the Lord today. And so together, when we talk, uh, we pray that God will restore his marriage. It's going to take a miracle, but God is up to the challenge. Friendship, how important it is. Finally, this morning, marriage is a great mystery. Verse 32 and 33, this is a great mystery, Paul says. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respect her husband. And so, isn't it amazing that Paul calls the marriage relationship a great mystery? Now, think of how Paul spoke of the gospel that it was God's mystery, hidden agents past, but now being revealed to us. And so Paul uses the same word to speak of the marriage, mysterion. But he doesn't just call it a mystery. He actually says it's a great mystery, mega mysterion. In other words, extraordinarily great, wonderful, profound, that can only truly be understood with the help of God's word and through the Holy Spirit. And so marriage, the relationship, truly is a profound relationship, and it reveals some powerful and wonderful, profound truths. And so one of the truths is, is that marriage is not just a relationship of human love, but it's a portrayal, a demonstration, a showcase of divine love. And that's the point that Paul is making in this whole text, that when we do marriage right, and even when we fail, and even in our weakness, if we allow the gospel of grace to come in, what we do is we portray, we display, we model to the world the majesty, the wonder, the beauty of Jesus Christ himself. Let me leave you with this point. God's not looking for perfect marriages. What God is looking for is people who will just submit themselves uh, to, to Christ, allow the gospel grace to work in their heart, and let God work in us in such a way that we learn to love him and our spouse in a most wonderful way. And one of the blessings that we have is not only does God call us to this, which is a, a really wonderful thing, but he provides for us every resource we need so that we can accomplish God's purpose. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, thank you for the relationship of marriage.
Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your plan. Thank you for your design. Lord, how many things in our world today are actually founded upon uh, couples being able to enter into this relationship and do it in a way that you intended for us to be able to do it. Lord, again, you don't demand perfection. You give abundance of grace. And Lord, your promise is where sin abounds, where difficulties happen, where weakness occurs. Lord, you give more grace. And so encourage our hearts today that wherever we're at, at, whatever we're facing, Lord, you will provide for us what we need. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.